like that. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Beyond the Course podcast. Today's guest is professional golfer Jay Bowers. Jay, how are you doing? Thanks for joining me. I'm good, thanks. How are you? I'm very good, thank you. So, uh, first of all, I just want to reflect on, on your season this year on the Rose Ladies Series, because you just finished that now. That's just finished a couple of days ago. Um, how do you kind of reflect on your season on that particular tour? How do you feel like you've played? How did the tournaments go? I thought, first of all, it was a great tour. Um, it's sad that it's come to an end, but I think it's I think it's been a good season on that tour. We've had four or five events over my way, which was nice. It wasn't like we needed to trek down to London. So that was nice to play like a, a bit of a linksy kind of theme for the month. Um, but no, it, it's, it's been good for that tour. I mean, the, the, last, the, the last week I just played a stretch of London. So the last, the last three events wasn't my best ball striking, but I kind of realized that when I've got like my D game ball striking, my ability to score is a lot better now. Mm -hmm. You know, the first two events I was up there in the top 10 for the majority of the rounds, but then just threw stupid shots away towards the end. So it's been good overall. I think I've seen my game progress over the time and obviously I got a win, which was nice. So Yeah, well, we'll move on to that in a little minute. But just touching on the tour, as you said there, it's obviously really good what Justin and Kate are doing. How did you kind of, first of all, hear about it, get into that particular tour? And yeah, give us a little bit more information about what those two guys are doing for, for the ladies on that tour. It was during lockdown, actually. We were obviously um and ah about what's going to happen with our season. And then that obviously got launched, that tour. And obviously we're all, we were going crazy about it because it was like for women to not need to get a flight to events, that's rare. Mm -hmm. And to be able to compete in our home country, that's huge. So, you know, we were all buzzing about that. But no, it's huge what they've done for us, especially Justin and Kate and the sponsors that they've brought on board, American Golf, et cetera. So it's just, they've got big companies behind them. We've got a great platform. Obviously it's covered by Sky Sports and, you know, the coverage and the footage for women's golf has, has been exposed even more because of those. So we're all so grateful towards them. Yeah. And going on to that win then. So obviously it was a good couple of tournaments for you because the one before that, I think you finished tied seventh, which I think was your kind of best finish so far in the season. And yeah, then you went on to obviously fun. to obviously win. So I mean, what was different those couple of weeks, but obviously particularly the win, did you feel, was it just confidence? Were you just hitting it better? What, what was the keys for you? I felt like my game had been trending the kind of week before to, before that. And at Hillside, the practice round, I absolutely ripped it. But then the tournament at Hillside, I hit it well, but I just wasn't hitting it close enough to the pins to create more birdie opportunities. So then I went on the range afterwards. I was like, I just want to get a good swing feeling for tomorrow for Birkdale. And I did hit a lot of like slow-mo swings to really exaggerate those feelings that I like to feel. And then pitched up at Birkdale and it was, it was the day for me. Yeah. I mean, what I find I, is just I about the Rose really Lacey... Like well, I mean, yeah, it's a great course, isn't it? Obviously very iconic. I mean, one thing I do find interesting about the Rose Ladies Series, though, is that it comes in short bursts, doesn't it, in terms of the tournament? Yeah. So I think that day, as you said there, you literally played, was it the day after Hillside or two days after at Birkdale? Yeah, it was literally Hillside and Birkdale. Yeah, so I mean, they obviously are single day events, but how do you kind of like prepare yourself for that when you've got, say, three events in the space of like five days? I mean, it must be pretty tiring mentally, physically, all the traveling around, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, that was a really fatiguing week. We had JCB after Birkdale, like two days after it. And then we had Scotland that weekend. And thinking back to it, I shouldn't have done Scotland because I was just absolutely knackered physically and mentally. Yeah, I mean, we, 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 won't, we won't talk about the tee shot you put in the water, Jay. <laughs> How did you know about that one? I was, I was stood right next to the first tee watching you. Oh, no, you were there. Oh, yeah. yeah. But you know I, I, was, that I mean, was, that, that, for me, that was... It, I hit on. it. And I'm almost, it's like I wasn't there. And I'm like, you know, your thoughts are coming in, like, did you actually just do that? And I'm like, no, nah, I'm dreaming. And then I look at my boyfriend who's caddying me and here's the shock on his face. And I'm like, okay, it wasn't a dream. I'm like, just check us another ball. Like, I was absolutely fine. There was no nerves, nothing came up. And I was kind of looking at all these people around me. And I'm like, hmm. So anyway, he chucked me the ball and obviously ripped it down, ripped the second ball down the middle. Yeah. I'm like, I thought I did that at least. <laughs> it's just one of those moments for us as amateurs. You just... It's so relatable, isn't it? I mean, you went from obviously the win, which is the biggest high you can get, 
to then a moment like that where from the start you literally have to try and recover your round right but because yeah, yeah. I, I, we went down there to cover it and I went with my girlfriend who, who does some of the work on the golf stuff with me and I said oh this is you know Jay and she's the one that won last in the last tournament and then we watched her on the first tee and it was just like oh no and but like <laughs> like you said it must be because you know you're probably knackered after all you know those three tournaments in a row and it's yeah, a lot, to, a lot taken it's out of you, isn't it? Simple as well. I'm not a fan of when there's a shadow like behind the ball mm. or just in what I'm looking at. And I think I just got distracted a bit by the shadow. That's all that's all that happened because it was it was a bit shocking to me, obviously, as well. But um no, it was you know, I I came back well from actually that first hole, started with the trip on and finished whatever I did, considering around that course, because you've got every element that comes into play. There isn't a spot around that course that you can afford to not be on your game like tee shots pin positions greens are like the most slopiest greens you'll ever play mm -hmm. that's a really really tough track but um no it, it was a great week I enjoyed it because obviously you know the links courses are about an hour and a half away from me so it wasn't too much of a journey um but it was just a great week yeah I mean go back to the, obviously the positive one there we won't focus on that I mean that, that win there, was there any particular key moments you fought during the round? I mean, obviously it went to a playoff hole, which you ended up making, I think, like a six-foot birdie. But was there any particular moments during the round, during the actual normal 18, that you just, you felt like that was the one, that was the one that gave me the, the lift to go on and win it? I actually started with, I think it was the first three holes were a bit of scrambling par saves. So I knew that my putting, you know, my putting has been feeling really good. That was trending as well. So, you know, I kind of few eight footers for par those first three holes. And then, you know, I took advantage of the par fives. I, was, I birdied most of those. And I just felt like I was in complete flow state for the whole round. I wasn't really aware of what I was doing. I was, I can't really think of any bad shots I hit that round. So it's almost, it's one of those games that everybody wants where every single part of your game just comes together on the day and it did. Um, and yeah, I think I made, I think I made a bogey and got, yeah, got to four under and obviously birdied the 17th again. So I think but it yeah, was the, was was it the 13th par five when you were on kind of like the right edge of the green in two and then you chipped on the third and I think you had maybe like a six, seven foot birdie there. Was it, I think it's yeah. it the 13th, the par I five? I can't even remember unless I think about it, but yeah. Just all the, all the dream now, all the blur. The par fives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I, I remember I remember seeing that one and thinking, you know, you on for you on for free, and it was still a pretty nervy birdie put on that four. Then, um, obviously the the playoff hole. I mean, that was only six foot, but in those kind of moments, I mean, you said you after the round actually that you didn't really feel nervous, maybe a little bit, but not much all day. And so, what was kind of going through your head during that put? Were you were you thinking much? Were you just trying to get on with it? What were you, what were you thinking? I mean, the first playoff hole, I didn't hit a great drive for both playoff holes actually. Um, the other two girls did and I remember after that first playoff I was on the green and I had like a 30 foot birdie putt and they both had quite short putts in comparison to that for birdie and I thought okay mm -hmm. you know I just kind of on that green I remember saying to myself it is what it is you know it, it might not be your time right now and you're absolutely, and I'm absolutely okay with that so I think that kind of letting go of that want kind of relinquished that block to me wanting that there and then. And they obviously missed the two birdie puts. And I thought, right, it's my time now because I'm being provided, you know, with another chance to go and redo the hole. So mm -hmm. I did. And on the second playoff hole, I think when they obviously one girl struggled down that hole and then the other girl had a birdie put. And as soon as she missed that, I kind of just sensed that, you know, this is mine now. And then obviously I think it, I think it was a nine foot put ahead actually. And it just kind of dropped in out the, in the side. So. I mean, it's nice. a shame. It's a shame for the other girl. I can't remember her name now, but she had two chances. Lauren I think Gordon, to yeah. yeah, she had two chances, didn't she? On the normal eighteen, I think it was her that had a birdie putt, and then again yeah. in the playoff. So it's a it's a shame. But as you said, I think when that kind of happens, you're like, mm, maybe it is my time. Yeah, because I actually had a three hour wait between finishing mm -hmm. and then teeing off the um, playoff. Because I was kind of looking at the leaderboard, my phone ended up dying as well. I was just constant refreshing, <laughs> and I thought. Mm, there's people here that are coming up now you know the last two holes are birdieable I thought we're actually contemplating driving home because I thought no she's got it but I'm not sure if there's a, a mix-up with the scoring or somebody said oh that's Lauren and I'm like no it's not Lauren I thought she had a birdie putt and I thought right so my boyfriend was like she just you know we're gonna need to start driving home he actually had 
a match at his club that night. And he told me about it a few days before. He said, oh, I've got a match after, you know, you've played. And I'm like, what happens if I'm I'm still yeah. there and I'm, I need to do the playoff? And he went, well, I just cancel it and it ended up happening. So that was quite comical. But no, we ended up staying, obviously, eating, refreshing the leaderboard and then finding out that I was in a, in a uh, three-way playoff. So. Well, it was something I was going to ask you about because, you know, just in golf in general, I think it's one of the hardest sports in those pressure moments because you do have so much time to wait between shots, right? Like when you've got to make that birdie putt, you probably had, yeah. let's say, two minutes to think about that, knowing that that was a putt to win it. And I think that's what makes that sport so difficult compared to other where others where, say, like football, where it's all just in the moment and it's all happening really quickly. You don't have that same time yeah. to think. But then having three hours to wait, um, I mean, again, what, what were you kind of thinking through that? You're obviously refreshing the leaderboard, eating and stuff. Again, but... again, you know what I felt? I just felt in, still in that kind of flow state, just so content. And um, I just felt really chilled out. It was almost like I was in the place I was meant to be. Everything just, you know, happened. So obviously I was absolutely buzzing to get, you know, it, to go into a playoff. And uh, yeah, again, throughout that playoff, it was, I probably had the odd nerve on the playoff whole tee just because, you know, we were doing, drawing the names out of the hat and then you had all the cameras on you mm-hmm. and you're obviously you're teeing off. So, but no, it was a great day. And like I said, I just felt so relaxed the whole day. So how has that transition been? You mean you mentioned the, the cameras and stuff there at JCB. I, I imagine that was even more so, right? Because that was a big event, a lot of people there, a lot of cameras. And I mean, you turned pro in what, 2016, was it? Have you had like an event as big as that, much coverage as that, as the JCB one? Um, the way that they did JCB made it feel extremely professional. You know, they had all the ropes and stuff. That mm-hmm. was really, really well done. I'd say other than, you know, things like final qualifying and the Rose events, really, not, not, not really anything like that. But yeah, yeah, I turned pro in the back end of 2016, I think it was in like December. I don't know why I did that in 2016. I probably should have done it in 2017. But um, yeah, no, other than that, we've had the odd event, which feels like that, but that felt really professional in the sense that they had all the ropes and stuff and they really went to town on that and making us feel like VIP players. So. Yeah, a lot of big faces there and stuff, wasn't there as well in the crowd? You know, everybody who seemed to be interested in that one. But yeah, I just find it interesting because, you know, you obviously come from playing amateur and what have you. And in some of those Rose Ladies series, then maybe just a handful of people and then all of a sudden you have kind of like hundreds there watching you. Yeah, I mean, the rest of them have been closed events, even the last mm-hmm. three. We were able to take a guest each to Bearwood Lakes, the final, but the rest of them have been closed events. So it, sure. it was nice for JCB to have that audience and those people, because I always prefer playing when I've got an audience. It just seems to make me tick. Um, mm-hmm. And there was, you know, there was, a few, there was quite a few people at Birkdale as well. I had my best mate walking around too, so my own little cheerleader. Um, but no, it's, I always like a kind of a crowd or just people watching. Would you say that was your best moment in golf, best memory so far, that win? Definitely, yeah. It was just a surreal day. Even driving back, it just hadn't really landed. But no, that, I mean, that's definitely the best moment, yeah. I mean, the fact that you had to play JCB not long after, did you get any time to, to celebrate or anything like that? That's the thing, I didn't, because it was just like non-stop. Actually... No, the, the day after, I remember we went to do a practice round at JCB. My coach came and a few of his, his other players came and we went to uh, San Carlos that night. So we had a bit of a celebration, but mm-hmm. didn't go too wild, like literally a glass of champagne. And then I remember going to, have you heard of Hickory Smokehouse? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I love that place. We went there the evening straight after I'd won. We've been to Hickory's the night before, actually. And my boyfriend's like, let's go again because it's clearly working. <laughs> so we went and had a nice porn star martini. So that was my celebration drink. Good for you. And how do you prepare yourself in between the two types of tours then? Because you play on LET Access Series as well and you have done a little bit this season. And then obviously the Rose Ladies one. How do you kind of decide in between which events you're going to play and, and organise that schedule? Normally, it's just kind of really full on, but obviously with COVID and stuff, this year I said to myself, I'm going to be really selective over the events that I play just because 
it's not as easy as it used to be. You just got to adapt to it. It's quite draining in the sense that you've got to stay in those tournament bubbles or the COVID test, et cetera. So I've actually not played that much on the LET access this year. I've played, I think it's four events. Actually, I'm going to my fourth one, the end of October in Barcelona. So I've actually played more on the uh, rows this year, which has been so much easier, you know, driving to events, especially it's cut the expenses too, which is always a nice thing. But sure. yeah, I've only played about three or four on the, uh, the LET access this year and mainly rows and a few other uh, mini tours. Yeah, because you played as well on Clutch, you mentioned, and 2020, right? Yeah, I played one event on Clutch Pro Tour and a few on the 2020, which is quite local for me. So it's always nice to have a, uh, you know, an inclusive mini tour up near me. <laughs> What's been the main differences that you noticed between the tours? Maybe, say, the two biggest ones, the Rose Ladies and the LET Access Series. Um, is there anything different you do about, obviously, you know, you've got to travel and all that, as you mentioned, to the LET Access Series, but is there any differences in preparation and, and how, yeah, how you prepare for those different events? I think that it's, it is quite different in the sense that, you know, the LET access, you've got a proper three day event, whereas the rows, it's kind of like an 18 hole shootout. Mm -hmm. So it's nice in the sense that it's just 18 holes, rewrite the next round kind of thing. So it's quite different in that. And obviously with the row series, you've got to counter in the constant traveling so you go into one event practice round and then you, you've got to factor in all of those practice rounds and I think that's why coupled with all of the driving it ended up being quite tiring you know going from event back event back so it's just kind of learning you know what works for me when how many events am I done by do I need to like rein it in and do, have a bit of rest and stuff so yeah, I mean LET access it's a full-on week you're doing a full-on week of travel and you got your practice around you can kind of counter in your rest and you've got your tournament around. So it's different in that aspect, but mentality wise, you know, you've got an 18 hole shootout compared to a three round tournament. So it's different mm -hmm. in that sense. It's a difficult one, isn't it? I mean, the, the goal of those kind of tournaments like the LET Access Series is you, you need to be able to not win a certain amount, but you need to finish in a certain position, right? To achieve what you want to get from that tour so it's difficult yeah. to find that balance between just playing every single event as you said and try to get as many you know whatever points on the board and then sometimes just deciding that you know I need to have two events off for example because then you don't get the chance to to get those points do you I know that's the thing with the owner merit that's the well not a problem but that's my situation at the minute it's like I've not played in enough events to sort of stay in the order of merit and try and skip, you know, a stage of Q school. Mm -hmm. So I was meant to go to France next week, but I thought, what am I going to France for? It's not going to make a difference for me on the order of merit. I'm still going to be pulled out because you've got to play a minimum of six events sure. to qualify for the order of merit. So I think it's top 25 skip first stage of Q school. So because I've not played six, I'm going to be pulled out of it along with all the other players that have not played six. So, um, yeah, it's one of those. I'm going to Q school at the end of the year and it is what it is. So it's all manga in December. Yeah, so we talked about that a little bit off air. You go to Q school in December. Um, any other plans? I mean, I imagine Rose Lady Series will, will be on again next year. Any other plans yeah, besides I mean, Q school? And what, what does the future, let's say, next year look like for you? I guess next year is all dependent on Q school. That's the thing. Um, I've got, obviously, I've got one last event on the LET Access, which is combined with the Santander Tour, the, the one in Spain, which is another really good tour, actually. Um, so that one's in Barcelona at the end of October. And then after that, it's like a month of prep for Q School. So it'll be two weeks in La Manga, and that will determine what happens next year. So, you know, try and finish as high up as I can, try and get my card. If not, try and get a higher category and get into some LET events next year and combine that with access. But hopefully, you know, we're all going for that card. So hopefully it's a full season on the LET. And obviously we'll sure. play the Rose events too, if that goes ahead. And what do you think you need to do anything different, maybe like to prepare yourself for Q school and for that next level? Is, is there anything you've thought of that you need to, need to do to take yourself to that next level, if you like? I think that the thing with Q school, everyone builds it up in their mind and they put a lot of pressure on themselves going into that. So I'm just going to try my best to just see it as a normal tournament and not necessarily go there with um, to prepare like loads of time when I get there to prepare. So I played the, I played the courses last year, at Q, not last year, it wasn't on last year, the year before at Q school. So I kind of know them, 
but I'm just going to try and treat it as a normal tournament and not necessarily put that extra pressure that is inevitable during Q school because it's kind of, you know, the most important thing to do. Good stuff. And just to, to get to know you a little bit more, tell us a little bit about how you get started in golf then. Um, I said off air, you know, you're from Stockport as well, near me in, in Manchester. So yeah, mm-hmm. what age did you get into golf? Why did you get into it? And tell us a little bit about your kind of amateur career all the way up until you did turn pro in, in 2016. Well, I actually started golf really late. I started when I was 18. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I played a lot of sport before golf, as I think everybody does as a golfer. So, you know, I was a big hockey player, played that to a high level. And before that, I was a big footballer. So I've always kind of tried every sport when I was younger, taken one on, dropped that for the other. And then before I knew it, I was a golfer. But um, I started going to a range local to me when I was a hockey player kind of got hooked on it as you do started teaching myself a bit and I thought I like this and then I started kind of dropping hockey for the golf and I thought mm. so that's when I went down the full-on golf route and I remember being in sixth form and thinking I really like this I want to see what I can do with it because you know I've always been quite driven and determined with whatever sport I've played and I had a place at uni and I thought I'm just going to defer it for a year and focus full-on golf and I did that before I knew it, I was deferring another year at uni to continue that golf. And I just thought, I'm not going to end up going to uni. So that was that. And then uh, I became full-time amateur golfer. And yeah, that was that. I didn't have much of an amateur career. I was probably an amateur for about four or five years, maybe, before I turned pro. But I, you know, I brought my handicap down quite quick. And yeah, that, that was that. I've always played every sport you can imagine and, and done as much as I could up until I took on golf and that's that that was the main focus did you consider college in America or anything like that playing golf in America that's the thing looking back now I definitely will definitely would have done that if I'd have started a, an, a younger age a more normal age as people would say it because I don't think at the time I would have probably gotten into a great college with the handicap I was off but I think that if you're given the opportunity to do the college route in America, I'd definitely do it just because I can imagine the experience you gain. And, you know, big tournaments have just become the norm because you're just competing week in and week out. So, but now for me at that time, really a consideration. But looking back, you know, if it had started a bit younger, I would have definitely gone that route. I mean, what is the ultimate goal for you? I mean, you know, you've got LET. LPGA but everybody has different goals what was the kind of ultimate goal for you and what is it at the moment ultimate goal is to get on the LPGA you know the stepping stones to that um but as any female golfer the LPGA is the goal you know to Mm -hmm. become the best that I can be I feel like with every other sport I've played in the past I've always achieved and you know excelled really well in those but I've never fully felt like I've it's hard to, hard to explain, but kind of express my full potential in those sports. So golf for sure. me, I thought, sure. right, with this one, I'm going to go all out and I'm going to completely bypass all of those, you know, barriers that you, you put up for yourself and stuff. So it's just, it's just a great game to kind of, you know, help you grow. Self-growth is huge in this game and it just mirrors everything back to you that you need to work on in yourself. So that's why I love the game. It's a love-hate relationship, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, have you considered kind of like LET is almost a stepping stone? I know it's kind of like an equal tour, but if you look at a lot of the professional men, for example, they do well on the European tour, don't they? Then after that, they kind of get noticed enough to get on the to the PGA tour. So I don't know whether it kind of works fairly similar for the women's game. Yeah, I guess it does. I mean, you know, my short term goal right now is to obviously get my card this year at Q School and get onto the LET and and start doing well on that and establish myself as a player on that tour. And then we'll see where we go from there. But there there are kind of, I guess, the stepping stones are for your personal goals. But, you know, to get on the LET is my next goal and to establish myself there. And then we'll see what happens. But the ultimate dream for any female golfer is to, you know, be in America and, and play on the LPGA tour. Cause I just absolutely love Florida. So I'd love to be based there at some point in the future. Yeah. I mean, there's no better place to, to play golf is there and live in America than Florida. I mean, have you got much experience playing golf in, in the States then? Yeah. A few years ago, 
I think it was a few years ago. I used to I used to go there. My my previous coach had a uh, house out there, so I'd go out there for a few weeks of training at a time, and I'd play on you know some inclusive mini tours like the Moonlight Tour. So that was great experience, and I guess that kind of got me used to competing against guys and that becoming comfortable. So that's why you know I like all these other tours like the 2020 and the Clutch Pro Tour because. I guess it's kind of a comfortable environment for me to compete against the guys because I'm used to it. And obviously there's not that many female golfers when you join a golf club, you, you just used to playing with the guys and that you get friends with and stuff. So yeah, I've, I've played out there on a few tours, especially the Moonlight Tour. And um, I think there's another, there's quite a lot of tours out there. The only problem is, is they're expensive, you know, like the entry fees and stuff. Sure. In comparison to Europe, they're, they're a lot more to enter. And you're, talk, you're talking about a, a full commitment as well, aren't you? I mean, playing in, in the UK with all the traveling, et cetera, is one thing, but to, to go over to the States and, and try and make a, a good go at that would, would be a big, a big commitment, wouldn't it? Yeah, you'd be living out of your car like all these guys. Uh, <laughs> trying to make it all. <laughs> but no, it's, it's a lot more expensive to play over there, but I do love the courses. It just makes me happy to be out there. I love Spain as well, actually, you know, southern Spain, that... I love Spanish courses, even though some of them are a bit crazy. Yeah, maybe just get yourself camped out on a on a beach in Florida. Give, yeah, give it a go out be, over there. My life would be sorted then. <laughs> yeah, well, Jay, thank you very much for doing this. Really appreciate your time, and uh, yeah, all the best reaching those goals. I hope to see you on the uh, on the LPJ one day. Thank you very much. It's been great. Thank you very much, Jay.